Hi, this is Cherie Bergeron. I'm here today with Dr. Bruce Douglas, a Chief Evangelist at IBM Rational. Thanks for joining me, Bruce. Well, thank you very much, Glenn. I'm happy to be here. So, how is Agile development different in a systems organization versus an IT software organization? Well, there are a number of special concerns for systems organizations. First of all, there's typically hardware and software co-development, which is something you don't do in IT systems. In addition, you often have safety or reliability or security concerns that don't come up in an IT organization, although there is some overlap with security. You also have regula regulation uh, considerations, uh, certification issues. Uh, you often get requirements handed off from a system engineering team, and you have to work closely with hardware engineers to make sure the system as a whole uh, meets the functional needs. So it's, it's a larger uh, scope problem in many cases than simply an IT system. So I know that you work with systems companies in their agile adoptions. How do you address those kinds of challenges? Well, people who move to agile methods in the system space do so primarily for quality improvement, uh, better defect rates. <clears throat> the second reason people move to agile is to improve time to market. So if you're dealing with an aerospace company, for example, or a medical company, they want to basically improve quality. So the basic way I come in is we start off with a quality assessment uh, for their R&D department, and we look at mechanical engineering and electrical engineering and system engineering, quality assurance, testing, project planning, and how all of them are working together. Once we understand the environment in which they're working, we can then address a plan to address their particular problems. I don't believe in showing up with a hammer and saying, show me where your nails are, but rather, tell me about the fasteners you have, because they might be using different kinds of screws, you know, flat screws and hex screws, and, and they might be using Velcro and glue in some cases, and a hammer may not be the right tool. Once we've identified what their capabilities are and where they would like to be, in terms of their productivity, their quality, and the, the defect rates, then we can design a customized plan for helping them adopt incrementally. So I'm a big believer in using agile methods to adopt agile methods. So you have to put uh, KPIs or metrics on the ground to measure success, uh, do some sort of best practice that help that particular customer, and once you achieve facility and, and capability in, that, uh, in those set of practices, then improve by adding the next set of practices. So Bruce, what kind of recommendations do you have for systems companies that are seeking to adopt Agile practices? Well, first of all, I think you have to be honest uh, with yourself as a company as to what you're good at and what you're bad at. And oftentimes, an outside point of view can really help you understand uh, where the, uh, the truth actually lies. You know, what, what you're good at, what you're bad at. And once you understand the problem, then you have to be open to changing how you work. Because this is all about invention. It's all about creating new things that didn't exist yesterday but have to exist tomorrow. And you want to have them done with high quality systems. And this is especially true in systems that are regulated like safety critical systems like uh, I was talking this morning with a nuclear power plant. They want to go from analog controls to digital controls. Uh, last week, I was talking to an avionics customer that wants to, to, to improve their quality in their avionics uh, pursuits for D170C qualification systems. So it really is custom, depending upon the needs of the customer, but in general. The basic principle is use evidence-based work. So whenever you do a plan, software, a software a schedule or a plan or a systems plan, it's always a theory. It's a theory about how life will unfold. Well, one of the laws of Douglas is the difference between theory and practice is greater in practice than it is in theory. And what that means is you really have to justify your plan. You have to watch how things are actually unfolding as you execute your plan using these metrics that monitor success. And use those metrics to change how you work to improve how you work. So you have to be open and honest to be able to accept that information and to apply it to your systems. So in one of your talks, you were speaking about the Agile Harmony process. Can you tell me a little bit more about that, what it is and the value it provides? Sure, I've been involved in, in systems development for uh, over 30 years. And I've worked on uh, well over 350 projects. And over this time, I've developed opinions <laughs> about what works and what doesn't work based on, on this evidence. And so I've developed this process over this time. It, it was originally called uh, ROPES process, the Rapid Object Oriented Process for Embedded Systems. And then in the 90s, I harmonized it with uh, some system engineering best practices to come up with an overall process called Harmony. 
So I'm the author of this process. And it embodies uh, what are currently the best practices in agile and model-based development, uh, high, high security, high reliability systems development. So it's a combination of a set of practices where you identify uh, worker roles, uh, such as you know, modelers or system engineers or quality assurance, what it is they do, the tasks they perform, uh, the inputs and outputs of those tasks, uh, definition of work products, and this is all captured in a, uh, in a process capturing tool called Rational Method Composer, which then we can uh, print out, if you will, to a website so you can give process guidance. And a lot of companies in various industries, such as aerospace or medical, use the Harmony process to uh, base their work on as they run their projects. Well, Bruce, we've talked a lot about process change in, sy in systems companies. How can tooling and automation also be of benefit in an agile process? Well, I think that it's clear you have to understand that process is the most important thing. Understanding what needs to be done, who needs to do it, what kind of work products can produce is, is the key. You need to start there. Once you've done that, then you can talk about what parts where it might be beneficial to automate with tooling. Tooling is useful in a couple of places. One where the human doing the work is an error prone process. Mm -hmm. So you want to use tooling to automate that process to remove those sort of human introduced errors. The other place is some of the work is horribly uh, error prone, or it's not error prone, but um, horribly work intensive. And if it's work intensive, then you'd like to do, reduce the cost of doing that effort. For example, traceability. The D178C standard requires detailed traceability between the high level requirements, the low level requirements for design, the source code, what's called the uh, executable object code on the target, the test cases and test procedures. Manually managing all of that information is extremely error prone, mm -hmm. extremely hard work. It, it takes hundreds to thousands of hours on a typical project. Tooling it can reduce that by a factor of 50 or 100. I mean, it's, it's a tiny amount of the work as compared to doing it without tooling. So we look at opportunities to automate parts of the process based on what you need to get done. So it's not that the tool is the central piece, but tool is, it's like um, Sigourney Weaver in Aliens. She gets in this big robot suit and beats up the queen alien. That's a tool that is called a Waldo. And I think of these tools as Waldos that help us get our jobs done better. So do systems companies have a harder time adapting to change, change moving to an agile process than IT companies? Absolutely. Uh, nuclear power plants, for example, they're a very conservative bunch. I think that's a good thing, mm -hmm. okay? We want that. We want that. People who build aircraft, these are very conservative people. I think that's, again, a good thing. I don't know if you've ever been on a plane and a pilot comes on on the, air, on the intercom and says, oh my God, is there a programmer on board? <laughs> I hate when that happens, yeah. <laughs> okay? So conservative is a good thing. On the other hand, we're also adding more complexity. If you look at the complexity curves, it's increasing not linearly, but exponentially. So we have to have ways of dealing and managing that level of complexity to build tomorrow's systems which are more capable, more interconnected, and frankly, just more complex. So we have to have ways of building those systems with, less, with fewer defects and in less time uh, to achieve those in increased capabilities. So they recognize, and these industries recognize, that there is a need to improve how they work. And so they're adopting things like model-based development, using agile methods in, in a very precise, uh, regulated way, and they're improving their quality, and they're improving their time to market, but they're doing it in a conservative adoption pattern, which I, again, I think is warranted. Again, use evidence to you know, show me that this is working. Don't just hope and pray. Prayer is fine, but it's not a good substitute for engineering. 